That's a hard act to follow. Uh, Please rise and join me in the reading of God's word. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. I tell you the truth, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen, will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Anyone who breaks one of these one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. Thank you. Um, As I read through the Sermon on the Mount, obviously, perhaps you've noticed, I would say obviously, but maybe not, I've been preaching through the first part of the Sermon on the Mount. And as I read through it, I'm continually amazed at how much is packed into it. Do you you realize that how incredible God's Word is? You said this is a hard act to follow. No, it's not. Whenever we bring God's Word forth, that's the act. That's the most important thing. But it shows without question the timelessness of God's Word. God's Word is the blueprint for the disciple's life. Let me tell you, if we follow what's what's told us to follow, if we obey what's in God's Word, we can have the same power that those early disciples did. Did you guys, anyone hear that at all? If we pay attention to what God's Word tells us to do, well, let's say more than pay. If we obey what God's Word tells us to do, we can experience that same power and victory that those first disciples did. Amen. That's good stuff. Well, the passage today is an interesting addition to the sermon. At first reading, it seems kind of out of place. In fact, there are many people who have suggested that Matthew added this just to speak to his Jewish audience. The reason is that today we don't have the same understanding of the law as it did in Jesus' day. I mean, when we think of the law, and initially it was this, the Ten Commandments, that's the law that that God gave to Moses on, on the mount, and they followed that. But as time progressed, in addition to the Ten Commandments, became... The, the Pentateuch. They, they included the whole first five books of the Old Testament as the law. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. But then there was more to that. Then there was those who considered the entire Old Testament to be the law. Well, that wasn't enough. Then they added the scribal or oral law, the tradition, the understanding the, of that. And that was the law. So when we, under, when we think about the law in Jesus' day, this was really the understanding. This is what the Jews of his day thought that the law was, all of it. But the interesting part about this passage is, is and what makes us wonder is that Jesus, did you guys know that Jesus was a rebel? For his day, I mean, he, he really was a rebel, and he continually broke what rules and regulations the teachers and the scribes and Pharisees knew as the law. I mean, he didn't observe the ritualistic hand washings. How dare he? He even picked grain and his disciples ate it on the Sabbath day. To make it worse, he even healed people on the Sabbath day. And yet here, he speaks with great respect to the law. He says, in fact, not the smallest, not a jot or a tittle. And so I decided what in, actually is a jot and a tittle. So I, I got an illustration for you. The jot is the smallest letter in the Hebrew alphabet, and it's like an apostrophe. You guys know apostrophe? And a tittle is the smallest part. It's that little tiny part of a jot. He says not the smallest letter or the smallest part of the smallest letter will pass away until the whole law is fulfilled. 
That's a pretty bold statement. You, you begin to understand when they thought of the law this way, and, and Jesus was a rebel against the law, and then he makes this kind of statement. They had them scratching their heads a little bit. So the question is, if you're following with your notes, what was Jesus talking about? What is Jesus talking about here? The question, of course, is what does Jesus mean by the law? Did it mean the same to him as to the people of his day, or was there something different? See, to the Jew, the law was a collective of rules and regulations that gave boundaries for life. And they taught that any infraction of these rules and regulations was punishable by the leaders and even ultimately by God Himself. They would at least earn God's disfavor. The scribes in, interpreted the principles of the Ten Commandments so that we could understand them. and that, That's a good thing, but, but as we can see, they went a bit too far. We can best understand it when we see it in action. The law laid down that the Sabbath day was holy and there was no work to be done on the Sabbath day. That, that seems pretty self-explanatory. But the Jewish leaders in Jesus' day had a passion for interpretation and definition, so they went beyond and began to ask questions like this. Okay, what is work? We're to do no work on the Sabbath day, so we have to define what work is. Maybe it's mowing your lawn. I, I don't know. And, and then they went beyond that, and they said, okay, so carrying a burden is work. Carrying something well, if carrying something is, is work, we have to define carrying how much. Does that make sense? So what is a burden? So the scribal law laid down this. A burden is food equal to the weight of a dried fig. Milk enough for one swallow. Honey enough to put on a wound. Oil enough to anoint a small finger. Water enough to moisten an eye salve. Paper enough to write a simple notice upon. Ink enough to write two letters. Read enough to make a pen. And it went on endlessly. They began to define all of those kinds of things. They spent hours, endless hours, arguing. Is it okay to move your lamp in your home on the Sabbath day? If your lamp goes out, is it okay to relight your lamp? Is it okay for a woman to wear a hairpiece on the Sabbath? Or is it okay for someone to put in their false teeth? Yeah. Is it okay to pick up your child if they fall on the Sabbath? It, it went on endlessly and endlessly. Their religion became a, a group of petty rules and regulations. Legalism. Well, the way it started is with the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments were what God gave to Moses, and they were the, the basis and foundation of all of the Jewish law. But they added to those Ten Commandments, then the, the explanation of them was that oral and scribal law. That was, it wasn't written down yet, but it was just what they taught about the interpretation of the Ten Commandments. Well, then it wasn't uh, until the third century that they wrote what was called the Mishnah. This has gone too fast here. But the Mishnah, which was the explanation of the oral tradition of the Ten Commandments, was 800 pages long. And then later, they wrote the Talmud, which was explaining the Mishnah. It was commentary on the Mishnah, and it was 12 volumes and grew to 60 volumes of commentary on the Ten Commandments. Hmm. So to the strict Orthodox Jew in Jesus' day, the law meant keeping all of the laws. I mean, they were considered literally life or death, matters of eternal destiny. Well, clearly, this is not what Jesus meant, because he repeatedly broke them, and he even condemned these kind of laws, the petty rules and regulations that came to be known as the law of his day. So we have to ask our question, is that what Jesus meant? Is that really what he meant? And we'll discover the law behind the law. This is number two, if you're following what then was the real principle behind the law and the message of the prophets Jesus came to fulfill? When we look at the Ten Commandments, we find the essential foundation of the law. Do you remember the Ten Commandments? They're found in Exodus 20. I want to read them for you. Exodus 20. And God spoke these words, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. 
You shall not make for yourself an idol in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall not bow down or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sins of their fathers to the third and fourth generations for those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations for those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you nor your sons nor your daughters, manservant, maidservant, animals, nor alien within your gates. I didn't know they had aliens back then. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that's in them. But he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. I'll take a little side note before I continue. That's the, the heartbeat of what Sabbath is out. And I appreciate our church um, pushing me to take a Sabbath. It's a, it's a time of rest, but it's not just, not just a physical rest, although it's a part of it, but it's mental and emotional and spiritual and and it's going to be a 40-day journey for me uh, of uh, revisiting some places that are, um, have spiritual milestones for my life. I'm excited about the opportunity um, to do that, and I appreciate that. You guys will have to watch out for Laura while I'm gone. If it snows, come shovel the driveway for her. <laughs> Hopefully it won't snow. Let's continue with the Ten Commandments. Honor your father and mother so that you may live long in the land. The Lord your God has given you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house, your neighbor's wife, his manservant, maidservant, his ox, his donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. The theme, the central theme of the Ten Commandments is this word here. Respect. Respect. Reverence for God Reverence for the name of God, reverence and respect for God's day, respect for parents, respect for life, for property, for truth, for another's good name, respect for ourselves so that sins will never defeat us. This is the fundamental principle behind the Ten Commandments, principles of reverence or respect for God, for our fellow man, and for ourselves. Without them, there is no law. The law that Jesus is talking about is based on this word, respect. What Jesus came to fulfill and restore was a correct understanding of what the law was intended to do, which was to provide a guide for right relationship between us and God and us and our fellow man. And let me tell you, folks, if you don't have right relationship this way, you really won't have right relationship this way. It has to begin here. We, us, need to seek to know God's will and pursue Him with our whole life. Now, no one can deny that the, the scribes and, and, and Pharisees um, were very serious. They had good intentions. I, I, I believe that really, I believe their intentions were good. God appreciates zeal and, and obedience. But hear me this morning. What we're zeal for, for and what we're obedient to must be His will. Not our interpretation or it's empty. We need to realize that intent doesn't make wrong right. Do you know what I mean? Intentions don't make wrong right. I'll give you an illustration from my life. When my younger years, I loved to play basketball. And we always had open gym. And we had, um, one night we had a young man who came and we had a couple of simple rules. One of the rules was we don't use bad language. We control our tempers. We don't use bad language. Well, we had a young man who came, and, and he began, you know, when he would get upset, he would start to use bad language. And I said, listen, we don't allow that. That's one of our rules. If you can't control your tongue, you can't play basketball here. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to. I didn't mean to do it. I, okay, I, I understand. That's okay. Don't, don't do it. Well, we're playing along, and pretty soon he uses bad language again. We're going, listen, that's one of our rules. If you cannot control your tongue... You can't play basketball here. That's one of our rules. He goes, well, I didn't mean to. And I told you I'm sorry. 
And I said, that is perfectly fine. I believe that you didn't mean to, and I really do. I believe that you're sorry that you did it. However, if you can't control your tongue, you can't play basketball here tonight. You can come back next week, but you have to learn. Well, God knows I'm sorry. Good grief, you church people. I said, yes, God knows you're sorry. He really knows your heart. But sometimes, even when we don't mean to, and even when we're sorry, there's a price to pay for our sin. God is a holy, just God. I I mean, think about it. Moses didn't probably mean to disobey God in the wilderness. But the penalty of what Moses did cost him the chance to get into the promised land. He didn't mean to. God wasn't mad at him, but God set down a rule and a law, and he broke it. David, when he began the affair with Bathsheba, he had no idea that it would result in in him murdering her husband, Uriah. And you know what? There was still an incredible price to pay for that sin. I don't think they meant to. They didn't mean Uriah harm. Peter didn't mean to deny the Lord. In fact, he said, I will never, even if everybody else denies you, I will not deny you. And guess what? He turned around and denied the Lord. He didn't mean to. His intentions were good, but there was still a price to pay for that behavior. The intentions of the scribes, I think, were good. But just because they put together these rules and regulations... It didn't make an assurance of righteousness. And I found this is an appropriate. This, is, this crosses the line into where we live today. Practice what you post. <laughs> Folks, Facebook is a wonderful tool. But make sure what you post represents the God that you claim to serve. You notice I don't post very much. That's because I'm not really a Facebook guy. Call me on the phone if you want to talk to me or text me. I got texting down. Send a carrier pigeon, you know, whatever. But practice what you preach in every form that you preach it. So the last one is this, the question, the fulfillment of the law that Jesus came to do. Fulfillment is not found in obedience to the letter of the law, but in the relationship that it points to, a right relationship between God and man. You see, it's easy even for us to follow a checklist of do's and don'ts, but it's not enough unless you have a real relationship, a faith relationship, and let Christ take control. You see, at the bottom line, there's no relationship without it. Jesus said, unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law... You won't even make it into heaven. Do we realize, I don't think we do today, how radical and transformative that was? I mean, that was that revolutionary part of him inside. Is it any wonder they were mad at him and trying to kill him? I mean, what he was saying in essence is, all of this stuff that you guys consider so important, that you have turned into a religion and and that you have debated and and you have researched and you have studied and, and then you're forcing on people is worthless. That's pretty rough, isn't it? He said the only thing that really matters is obeying what God says to do. That's it. The rest of it doesn't matter. I I guess to put it in, in a modern rendition would be this way. Unless your righteousness surpasses that of those who are considered great in the church, unless you go beyond following all the rules and regulations listed in the manual of the the church of the Nazarene, you aren't even going to make it to heaven. Ouch. Ouch. Jesus wasn't saying that all of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law were doomed. He was emphasizing that relationship is more than rules and regulations, no matter how important or even how well-intentioned all of that stuff is. The law was found in His Word and written on our hearts, not with pen and ink or on tablets of stone, but by the Spirit of the living God. Folks, our manual has a lot of great things in it, a lot of great rules and regulations. They're, what they are, though, is guidelines for proper, li- proper living, and they're based on the Bible. 
But even if you've done them your whole life and are found blameless, you must count them as rubbish next to knowing Jesus as Lord. If you don't know Jesus as your Savior, your obedience to them only makes you a Nazarene and not a Christian. The other day someone asked me, he said, what church are you pastoring? I said, I'm pastoring the church of Nazarene. He said, oh, are, are you that, that narrow-minded group who thinks you're the only ones going to make it to heaven? And I said, no, we're even no, more narrow-minded than that. We don't even think all of us are going to make it to heaven. <laughs> The title over the door doesn't make a bit of difference if you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. In fact, there's going to be a lot of people in heaven from, from, from some of those churches. Right? Because it really doesn't matter unless you know Jesus in here. What's the old song? Jesus on the inside, working on the outside. Oh, what a change in my life. Jesus' statement leads to the question we must all answer. Does your righteousness exceed that of the Pharisees or the teachers of the law? Are you, are you trusting in your church membership, your attendance, your good works, your obedience to the covenants of, of Christian behavior and conduct, to the faith of your parents or your friendship with other Christians to make you right? If so, I've got some good news and some bad news. Number, The good news is this, first you're a great person. A person that someone people can look up to and respect. The bad news is none of that will open heaven's gates for you. Right. All of this stuff adds up to the righteousness of the teachers of the law and the Pharisees. See, Jesus commanded us not to do more. He commands us to be more. The written law focuses on doing things, but the law of Christ is found in change. Change from the inside out. Jesus really wants you to be changed from the inside out. Because, you know, change from the outside doesn't usually penetrate too deep. But when someone is radically transformed from the inside out, it becomes evident to everyone. You can't miss it. So the question today is, is your righteousness, what you consider righteousness, is it just like the religious leaders, religious leaders of Jesus' day? Is it based on the rules or regulations that, that, that you find are important in your church? Or is it based in relationship with Jesus Christ? Would you bow your heads with me? Father, thank you for this simple word. And it brings us all to a very real place of question and decision. Am I a Christian by title? Or am I a Christian by brand? In other words, has that relationship been burned into my soul? See, a title can be changed, but a brand is there forever. Father, as we continue in our worship time today and move into a time of prayer, Lord, I, I just pray that, uh, Holy Spirit, you would speak to our hearts. I pray that not one person would leave this building today without making sure, absolutely sure, positively sure, that they are in right relationship with you. Father, you are good. <laughs> we love you. And we invite you, Holy Spirit, just to speak to our hearts and minds. In Jesus' name, amen. As we come to our